Okay, here we go. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. I'm Jody Collier, here with Roy Crumrine. Hey, everybody. And Jonathan Lewis. Hello, everyone. Today we have a guest, my friend, J.D. Brewer. He is Apexish on Instagram and J.D. Brewer on YouTube. And he's been on before, and you've seen him, if you've watched any of my videos, you've probably seen him here and there. We've done some collaborations. J.D.'s got a fab shop. He's in business for himself, and he does industrial work like mezzanines, stairs, handrails, basically anything it takes to keep a plant running. So we thought we'd have him back on and talk about what he's been up to lately. So welcome back, J.D. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. Yeah. J.D. and I met first in chicago wasn't it chicago jd yeah yeah chicago yeah, chicago. chicago and then we and then we went to fab tech together in vegas and then went again last year in chicago so originally it was in chicago when we found out that we just you know live about maybe less than an hour from each other and his, his shop was in that area too so whenever i can uh, i drop by and visit and film some interesting stuff he's got going on so Thought maybe we'd talk about some of the more interesting things that he's been up to lately. Most recently, we had a JD, that is, I, I attended, but JD had a meetup at his shop for attendees and speakers of something that's called Workbench Con. I think it was the first of its kind here in Atlanta. Is that right, JD? Yeah. Yeah, it was the first time they had this convention. Yeah. Can you kind of explain what Workbench Con was and how that all went down? Yeah, it was a uh, it was a conference, not quite like a fab tech, not like a show where they're showing all the tools and everything. It was more about it was like seminars and it was all on content creation. Had all the big names on YouTube like Jimmy and April Wilkerson and Bob Clagg. Like it had all these people and everyone kind of did their uh, they all did a speech on it and kind of what they all excelled in. And so there was a class on Instagram. There's a class on SketchUp class on failure and like how to keep going after you try something and it doesn't work out. And in between that, there were some sponsors, Lincoln, Home Depot, a couple other sponsors that just kind of had little boosts, just a, like icebreakers, conversation starters is what I felt like kind of got everybody mingling and just talking about tools. And it's just in between classes, there's a bunch of mingled time between everybody mm-hmm. there. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a conference geared toward content creators. So if whether that's whether that means you got a YouTube channel or Instagram account or yeah. any anything basically, if you're a content, if you're putting stuff out there, yeah. you know, and you're trying to make uh, what you know, a lot of a lot of people, I would imagine a lot of people there were not making a full time living off of it. Some were yeah. definitely. You got some of them. Some people are definitely have made that transition from their day job to making content creating, whether it's YouTube or whatever their yeah, full time like thing. The- some of the people weren't just, uh, everybody was say, uh, a maker. There was a lot of woodworkers and stuff, but there were people that were doing stuff with food. They had like food blogs and vlogs or whatever you got, uh, websites, Pinterest. I mean, it was across, it wasn't just like like a YouTube thing. It was just everybody that's kind of selling stuff for themselves. Everyone, it doesn't matter what product you have, even if it's yourself or your blog, you could talk about your product and how you sell it, package it, distribute it, video it. Everyone talked about cameras. And they're like, what do you use? I'm like, oh, it's my phone. <laughs> Just my phone. <laughs> Everyone's yeah. talking about these lenses and all this other cool stuff. And I'm like, oh, I should probably get a camera. <laughs> yeah, but I tell you what, to anybody out there that's getting started, don't let that hold you up. Use oh, your no, no, phone. No. Use your yeah. phone, right? Just exactly. get started. Just do it. Yeah. It was just so funny. This... It, just, it kept coming up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I know everybody's gearing up. And um, so basically, basically, there's this, you know, maker movement out there. Unless you've been under a rock, living under a rock, you're probably aware, whoever's listening here, there's a maker movement. So all these YouTube channels of woodworkers, blacksmiths, people that fabricate stuff, welding, sheet metal, pipe fitting, you name it. You know, like you said, it could even be food and cooking and things like that. And people have been able to create enough content. And if you do it well enough and get enough of an audience, you can either make a supplemental income or turn it into a full-time income. So that's, that's kind of what this conference was geared toward kind of connecting the dots between the people that are interested in doing that. And then some of the sponsors like Home Depot, Lincoln Electric, Rockler, the other tool, tool manufacturers. There was a couple classes that that's what everything was about too. 
how to monetize what you do. Yeah. And how to, and maybe how to navigate some of the waters with sponsors and things yep. like that. Yeah. It's they're going to have stuff. it. Yeah. And they're, it's, uh, they're having it again. Apparently they called it. It seemed like a, a really big success with a few hiccups, like anything like that has when you first time, but, uh, they're going to have it again. Is it, did they say they're going to have it in Atlanta again next year or did they, you even- know, I, I don't know. Uh, I saw them ask where else they would like to see it come, what other cities they'd like people like to see it come to, but I'm sure they'll do it in Atlanta. It's easy. Atlanta's easy for everyone, everyone to get to. It seems like mm-hmm. it went over well. Yeah. So what were uh, like your biggest takeaways from, from attending? Um, well, there was actually Brad Rodriguez, the other half of the made for profit podcast and, uh, was it fix this, build this on Instagram and everything? Fix this, build that. Yeah. That's his. Yeah. yeah, Fix that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did a whole class on Instagram, which is what they do on their podcast a little bit, but it was all him and he kind of broke it down. I mean, it was like a, like a super legit seminar on Instagram. (laughs) It's pretty cool about how he's tracked his progress. And that kind of shows him his tips and tricks. And he had this whole side, uh, slide show and, it was pretty awesome. That was one cool thing. And then uh, April Wilkerson did a class on SketchUp. And SketchUp is kind of like Fusion 360 or uh, whatever design software. And that was really cool. She had people bring in their computers and she like walked everybody through a simple little project, which was pretty cool. Yeah. So the day it kicked off, there was a meetup at, at JD's shop where you kind of put the word out that if anybody had, you know, got there a little early before the evening kickoff or whatever, they could come by your shop, hang out. And, uh, man, I, I, I stopped by to, to sort of help out a little bit in case, you know, somebody had questions on welding. It wouldn't just be all JD. So glad you came, (laughs) (laughs) but it was a really good turnout. I, I don't know. Do you, did you have exact head count on how many people showed up for that? I know. I I just need to count it up. I think it was everybody that came. Uh huh. I want to take a stab at maybe seventeen or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I may be a little bit low, but there was Jimmy Deresta, John Malecki, April Wilkerson, and I'm going to leave out people, so I don't even want to keep going. But but they're just a bunch of people. A bunch of people I had not met before. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, and it was so it was really cool because what everybody had in common was they made stuff and they post they created content for either Instagram, YouTube, or both, or in other places. And uh, there was one girl, Ashley Harwood, I think was her name. Yep, she's yeah. a super boss bowl turner, you know, turns wood, <laughs> wood bowls on a, on a lathe. And, and, uh, I say boss because everybody that came up said that about her, like this, she is like the boss lady of wood turning. And so must be yeah. true if every, everybody says that. So it was very pleasant to, you know, I give her a little, just for a few minutes of just get her, you know, give her a taste of welding, Megan Tig. Yeah. She took right to it. And, you know, several others wanted to get a run a beat or two on, we had things set up, you know, you had, you had a TIG station, a, a MIG station, a stick station running off a generator, things like that, that they had not had a chance to do. So there was a, like uh, at least six people that had never welded before at all whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so that was cool. Just letting them just, you know, make some sparks. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it was a very low key chill atmosphere. So, you know, it, it went, went well, went really well. Yeah, I know. I saw Jimmy Duresta had posted on one of his stories where they were driving, and they're like, "Yeah, we're heading over to JD's shop." And I was like, "Man, that seems like that'd be a lot of fun." <laughs> Damn it. Yep. So let's talk about now. You know, because by some people have probably seen videos that you and I sort of worked on together. Most of those came from your previous shop, and you moved a few months ago into. He moved, JD moved like right down the street from where he was, but he, it's a pretty good upgrade on shop conditions because he was in there with a woodworker previously. And, and that's not a good mix when you got sawdust and sparks, you know, but now he's got more floor space, huge overhead crane, sharing space with, uh, you know, a guy that builds overhead cranes actually next, next in the, in the bay that they're, it's all one shop, but they're sort of like half bay, you know, kind of a thing. So let's talk a little bit about the new, the new shop and new things you've got, new tools and stuff since we first started working together. First being probably, um, uh, we have the overhead crane. How <laughs> that's really come in quite handy. <laughs> oh man. That thing's amazing. Yeah. You always want to have a forklift. Like whenever you have any kind of equipment, Jonathan, don't you have a forklift at your house or something like that? I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's like the dream of everybody to have something that can pick something up. But in a shop, sometimes you're limited on space on like where you can actually drive it. Having the overhead crane and like I pack stuff up against the wall and you can just like reach over and just pick something up from behind. Oh, it's it's amazing just for that. But yeah, the capacity of that thing is 
pretty amazing too. Yeah, it's a it's a heavy duty heavy duty crane. And in the previous shop, there was actually a video on my channel, probably something on on yours too. But you know, you built a you had to build a sort of a trolley gantry system before that you could you could still roll the door up and down and then attach that and then pull heavy stuff in when you get a delivery of you know wide flange or square tubing or something. You know, you could you could pull it in. No, it's a lot better than most people have. But now the overhead crane is along with big forklift out in the, out in the lay down yard, you know, then you can, it, it just, it just really enhanced your capabilities big time. Yeah. The overhead crane, the capacity on it is just, it can just pick up so much. And then you can also just kind of like, you can just keep pressing the trigger or bumping the button and it just moves it just like just a little bit, which is yeah. amazing. You got a little, lot of control with it. Yeah. It's kind of funny because right away, one of the first jobs you got was that 60 foot long rack. Yeah. <laughs> And that would have been, I wouldn't say it would have been not doable in your other shop, but certainly there'd been a lot more effort when it went into it, you know? Yeah. It would have taken a lot longer. I built the whole thing in 60 foot and then cut it apart. So then it fits. Like you don't have to worry about it. There was no math. I didn't think about it. I just looked, okay, this is a good place to cut it here, here, and here. Man, if I tried to make three 20 foot sections match up all the same, that would have been a lot more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, When you got it, when you got the crane, when you got the capability of picking up, something 60 foot long with, you know, that much (laughs) weight and that much floor space, then I I think it was actually a smart move to make it in one, one piece and then, and then cut it and then put the flanges on right there in place. And then there's, you know, it's going to be straight as straight as an arrow then. So that was a good move. That was a 60 foot long rack for some kind of industry that automotive mold. I forget what it was that, that there were, oh, rebar, wasn't it? Yeah. Rebar, engineered rebar or something like that. They just, they're threading like two inch solid stock. Ah, and it's going in like big concrete uh, precast overpass sections. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. That thing's pretty big, but I keep testing on just what I can build that it'll uh, it'll pick up. <laughs> yeah, so that was a pretty good sized job. And then when we were there for the meetup, you had a spiral staircase that was almost done. And then, uh, well, I might, might, don't want to get too far ahead, but let's talk about some things on the spiral staircase that people might run into if they're wanting to build one. Can you walk us through the build on that? Run. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It, it, the handrail seemed to be the the real yes, the real pain. That might be possible doing that in like say segmented, and it would give kind of like a bent rail look. That might be the only easy way of doing it. Rolling it without like a uh, industrial tubing roller. Mm-hmm. I I don't I don't see how I I don't want to do another one <laughs> at all. At my first shop I ever worked at, they built spiral staircases all the time. And the owner of the company had this roller that you could offset the dies just a little bit. And oh, yeah. he would just eyeball it, run it through, and it would come out in a corkscrew, and it would always just fit perfect. It was like, That's how do awesome. you do that? And he's like, <laughs> I don't know, I've built a lot of them. <laughs> you know, but yeah. that was the trick was offsetting the dies just a little bit so it would corkscrew the whole top rail. That's pretty much the best description of it. It's a corkscrew handrail on on that thing. And, you know, having to do it in short sections, it's you know, from what I've seen, that's the trick is making it so it sort of blends and doesn't have these abrupt changes. It's all looks smooth and, you know, got to got to do something. <laughs> yeah. To make that the Harbor Freight tubing roller is not making yeah. that happen. <laughs> that, is, that is not the tool that is perfect for that. <laughs> so this this uh, I, I know you'll probably some people have probably seen it already on JD's Instagram. I don't know if, if it's posted on YouTube or not, but, uh, you know, it's just a, a center post with plasma cut treads that slip over that, you know, and then all clocked a little bit evenly and then uprights with the handrail going up. And it's actually going to go in a home somewhere around here. So mm-hmm. I really, I really love to see that home because that's, that's gotta be a pretty tall ceiling for that thing to go into. It's, it's yeah. a monster. Yeah. The, the, the whole build was really easy. I mean, it's all just kind of simple geometry, I guess <laughs> it, uh, each one of the steps was like 30 degrees. So every third step, it was perpendicular to what I needed. I I would just kind of like, once I put on three steps, I would just turn it once. And then it was like, you put on another step level or plumb and then twist it 30 degrees, which would just put another step level. Then you would do another step plumb. It was really easy to build the whole steps. The handrail was the worst part. That's it. I remember one of the staircases that they made at that shop. They made a lot of them out of aluminum and uh, with like diamond plate treads for for the steps and all. But one of them, it had to start at one direction and then the landing had to go off of of a kind of a different direction. And when they got it all the way done and 
handrail, everything completed, they came out and they realized that the the landing was like 90 degrees off of where it needed to be. (laughs) It was like, ugh, that sucks. I mean, it was almost (laughs) ready to go to paint done. And they're like, well, how can we fix this? Yep. Can we change the building? That might be easier. I know, right? (laughs) Sometimes, at least as as a welder fabricator, you can make something work because you can go to cutting stuff and rewelding and modifying. But just think of a, you know, twenty thousand dollar part, you know, something that a machinist makes, and then toward the end he screws up and it's just done. Mm-hmm. It's just scrap, man. That's just one in a long list of many reasons why I'm not a machinist. <laughs> <laughs> Capability is another another reason. <laughs> Yeah. But I just always, always thought that because I've seen it so many times, man. I was like, man, my friend Ricky, when he would be take on a, a job, you know, and, and he'd write a check for 20 grand worth of material. And then, you know, he start making parts and he'd be sweating it toward the end, thinking he screwed them all up and you're going to have to eat it, you know, and just make new parts. That'll put you out of business if you make too many of those mistakes. Yeah. It's not good on your health. Oh, Something I was wanting to get your feedback on while you were at Fabtech this past year, you bought some of those Fireball tools, squares, and uh, Ooh, yeah, some of his other <laughs> things. I've seen you using them on your Instagram page and on your YouTube. You want to tell us a little bit about those? I know Jonathan, you got some also while you were there. Yep, I just got two of the small ones. How you like them, Jonathan? I like them actually. I don't get a chance to use them like you do. I've seen you use them a lot. Mine are still like shiny and new, and yours are broke in, but they work out really well, actually. Yeah, they're awesome. I love them so much. They make everything super square, and it's super easy to fabricate with them, too. There you are. Uh, Jonathan, do yours have the tabs? Do you have the... They do, yes. Good. Those yep. are the tabs. They they make the tool, I mean, perfect. It's pretty good by itself, but you have those tabs to it to where you can indi- indicate off the side. I finally feel like I can, like I'm a professional, <laughs> honestly. I've always been, like, you just kind of, you're always fighting it, using a speed square, using a framing square. You sit there and you do everything you take. I mean, you take your time doing it. And then you look at it and something ain't right. Something's not square. It's just something twisted. Not with these things. It locks them down. You got everything clamped. You throw a couple tacks. Boom. Everything is square. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to, uh. Just give a quick description of what they are for the listeners that may not know what we're talking about right now. Yeah, so there's two main types. There's cast aluminum, cast iron. The cast iron is great. Like if you're doing stick and MIG where you got splatter going and everything, it's great. They're heavy. That's the only drawback is they're heavy. So if you're doing like aluminum fab, you don't want the cast iron ones because they're just too heavy. But they're great by being heavy because you can just clamp stuff to them super square. So there's two main types of cast aluminum, cast iron, but then there's two main designs. You got the the monster square, which is just a big precision machined triangle. And by big, there's two sizes. You got the small size, big size. It's inch and a half or three inches. It just depends on what you're doing. They're both great. I use both of them. When you clamp something to the three inch, you know it's square. There's nothing else that you clamp anything to that's that big. So you got like a one, two, three block you would use to clamp things to. Well, that's cool. It's only like one inch or two inch deep. This thing's three inches by 12 inches wide. I mean, you're clamping stuff to it. It's, there's no wiggle room on it. It's, yeah. it's good in square. Yeah. If you got a framing square, a blade, you know, it, it's pretty good, but you got to hold it straight. I mean, you, there's room for error where you've mm-hmm. got that long three inch wide, flat precision milled surface you, clamp to you it. get it you get it clamped you know if you if you're doing like the most recent thing that i saw you do was that uh that gate out of mm-hmm. out of round tubing you know and and with the tabs and even with the radius on the tubing when the tabs you knew if all the tabs were touching and it was clamped dead nut square you know you're good right yep so those that, tabs are that's mm-hmm. awesome the guy's sharp as a tack the guy he's I think he's still doing his day job while he's building this business up. I don't know. I would imagine he's pretty close to going full time. Yeah, I think he's going full time with it. But it's not some it's not some guy in a cubicle designing these things. It's a guy that has sort of walked the walk and he knows what he would want as a fabricator. And he's a sharp guy. More power to him. He's designed a good product. Yeah. And the other design is the uh, the mega square, and that's got like an inside forty five. An outside 90 that has the 
like a, a corner missing, which is great for kind of skipping a corner, skipping a socket weld, or just kind of having to skip the corner of whatever you need to. That's great. But it also has the inside corner, which is, it's awesome being able to clamp something at square and actually being able to reach every reach side in, of the weld. Yeah, you can reach in and get a tack or even weld something out while it's clamped a lot of times. So just to, just to be clear, this guy doesn't even know we're talking about his stuff. This is not a sponsored episode by fireball or anything like uh-huh. that it's just that you happen to buy some and jonathan bought some and while we were at Fabtech, so it's good and we're talking about it and we do that sometimes sometimes we have a sponsor for an episode but we don't mind giving a shout out here and there where somebody just got a good product yeah yeah i know i've i've seen those and i'd really like to get my hands on some of them too to have around my little shop i can definitely see the benefits to them they help with everything like being square you would have like you have a speed square and then like what do we have now like a one two three block and then say a fixture table i mean these are like right there in the middle which to me with those I, you don't even need a fixture table really you can build stuff so square with that i'm, I'm saying if you need a fixture table you need a fixture table but they're so awesome you can build stuff just as good as a fixture table just a square without all yeah. that, that money if you were going on site and having to build something completely from scratch on site and you didn't know what you were going to have when you got there, you could, you could pretty much carry some like four of those squares and, and, uh, build most anything and have it be, have it come, you know, you could build a table from on the floor using those things as a sort of like your base, you know, if you had to, you could, you could definitely make something happen with them because you throw them in the back of a pickup truck as opposed to, you know, a fixture table is just pretty much a shop item. Yeah. Yeah, Well, that's enough. (laughs) Like I said, this is not, not a, (laughs) We're not being paid off by Fireball here. I know we've talked a lot about it, but, you know, it's a good product, most definitely. Um, so what else have you been up to lately? Um, just recently, I've been trying to be like IC Weld. <laughs> Had a bulldozer in the shop this week. That was kind of fun. I was supposed to ask you about. Yeah, that was that was pretty fun. This is the first time I'm ever doing that. A little art gouging, a little blowing a pen out, a little, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I've only done art gouging like once or twice a while ago. That was a lot of fun. It's just great being on Instagram because you can just go back and look at his posts and, <laughs> you know, see what he does. And then uh, it was kind of funny. I just posted something about it. And I was like, I'm going to give him a couple hours and I'm going to call him later. And uh, he started texting me about the post. And I was like, you know, I was just going to call you in a little bit. So I'm going to call you now. And uh, I just asked him how he would do it and all this other stuff. And then uh, it was a lot of fun taking it apart and then putting it all back together. I saw the... Um... David Demoise posted on that thread post, whatever you call it. And, uh, and I, I, he basically what he said was that Isaac, I see weld has been like one of the best resources for him ever. Cause he's asked him a lot of questions and he said, he's never stumped him ever. He's never didn't have an answer for whatever he was asking him, you know, how to do. So that, that is another, I talk about it, beat the dead horse in the ground about how cool Instagram is when it comes to that, the community on there, people just willing to help. That's just a perfect example. Isaac is a good dude and super, super talented individual too. Yeah. There was a, I was trying to get a bearing out of one of the arms, I guess. And, uh, I messed with it all day. I I tried to build this little thing to use a hydraulic jack to pull it out. It never once crossed my mind to use a torch because I just was like, that's precision. You don't no torch bad. Don't do that. Never mm-hmm. crossed my mind. And then uh, after fighting with it like all day, I was like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to clean up the shop for a minute. I sent Isaac a text. And I was like, hey, man, how would you do this? He goes, well, I'll just use a torch and turn down your oxygen and it comes right out. So I did it the next <laughs> morning, had it out in like 30 minutes. I was like, all right, mm-hmm. there we go. probably should have just called him sooner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It reminds me of a, you know, the, the first time I saw somebody running a bead around a bearing race to get it out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I thought, well, how smart is that? You know, it just, I guess it's common knowledge now, but you know, it, when you if you can run a bead on around around a, a race like that, it shrinks it and then it will come right out. You know. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do next time. I just went with the torch because it was already half broke. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I'm going to try that next time for sure. So we can't have you on here without talking some more about dual shield flux core. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The the guys that JD shares a shop with, they're building. I mean, they got this nice, huge overhead crane in the shop. But what the other guys do is pretty much build overhead crane components as well as some other products in there. So you just about got them converted to, to the dual shield now, don't you? Yeah. I didn't push it on them. <laughs> I just said it a couple times. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, I had to lay off Wyatt and he hired him. And this is uh, Andrew Gardner at, and he's at FEC Fab on um, Instagram. And they're working on a 200 foot long, 50 foot span crane right now with like two or three cranes on it. Pretty cool. Cool stuff. They're just, they're welding all kinds of big stuff. And um, recently he's kind of, he did, he just noticed how much I would get done with my welding and then like how much I was never fighting it. With Hardwire, he was trying to weld up some stuff and he was just kind of having to sit there and really take too long in welding, having to build up the weld, trying to just build it up. Seeing what I did, he he switched over to dual shield, and then now he's built plenty of cranes, and this is his first one building it 100% using dual shield, and he says it's faster. Not by, I mean, I don't know by how much, because no, it's faster. We weld them out just quicker, just travel speed. It's just faster. So I think he's a convert over to yeah. dual shield now. I have, I'm chuckling here while we're talking about, because when I, now when I say dual shield, I had a conversation with our friend Andrew Carden not too long ago, who's incidentally has left Lincoln now, and mm-hmm. he's he's uh, he's got another job with a uh, sort of a pipeline company up the, up there near in the New England area, and uh, he's loving it so far. I talked to him just just uh, day before yesterday. Nice. And uh, yeah, he's he's falling right into it, and he's they're really appreciating his skill, and uh, he's actually even doing some teaching already with that new company. But anyway, he was telling me about, you know, one of the instructors at Lincoln commented about uh, how I should not call it dual shield because that was a proprietary ESOB name or something like that. I, I may get that all wrong. But so technically, I think dual shield is a trade name, like either from ESOB or somebody. And I think I guess it's called is it outer shield? Is that is that the correct terminology or? Well, I'm using ultra core and outer shield. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's, it's kinda, just like uh, flap discs or uh, tiger paws. Exactly. And, and and MIG welding is gas metal arc welding, but it, that's a lot of words, and everybody knows what you're what you're talking about when you say MIG welding. So, mm-hmm. you know, I guess you can split hairs and say, well, technically it's – yeah, right. But, what it, you know, yeah. same as TIG welding, but I just, I just chuckle because somebody had a problem, thought I should correct that in my <laughs> vernacular <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> and cool. not call it dual shield anymore. But I'm going to continue to call it dual shield. Yeah. For the kind of work that you do, for the kind of work that Andrew does, you know, hot rolled mill scale, A36 material, pretty much not needing needing to clean it before you weld it or not at least not clean it much and still not have problems, not have porosity, not have undercut. That's what I see as the benefit and and the speed. And uh, yeah, and they're doing some stuff in position too, mm-hmm. which uh, when they were fabbing before, they'd have to roll the beam four different times. Now they're, you know, you're only doing it top and bottom, you know, or left and right. You're only flipping it once or twice to like, well, the end caps on and stuff like that when they were building. Yeah, it is for me faster. Yeah. For me, it is much better for, for like vertical uphill, not having to do any, you know, because it was only, it hadn't been very long when I was fighting with a vertical uphill thinking you needed to manipulate it. And, and it was Andrew that said, no, 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 just run it straight up. And I should have, I should have known that because I knew you already at the time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but um yeah i just thought you always had to manipulate something if you're going to go uphill and and you don't you know or super slight manipulation so anyway yeah. this episode is not sponsored by dual shield flux core <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway seems I'm like a, i'm a broken record i just talked about the same stuff yeah <laughs> well i'm a convert as far as as far as understanding anyway the benefits of you know how it helps you make money and yeah. that's really, I mean, what more, what more you need to say? It's a simple, robust process that, that works, you know? Definitely. I know uh, we've gotten a few emails about your last episode that you were on where you were talking about which dual shield you like to run and what, what wires and all you like to run. And uh, they've said, you know, like, thank you so much for that information. That was, that saved us so much time and money. And <laughs> they really like the results that they're getting and everything. So just wanted to let you know that the last episode oh. that you were on, you're helping a lot of people out too. Oh, appreciate it. That's awesome. Hey, I want to go back to Andrew again. You know, you did you guys go to that noodle house, Roy, you and Jonathan, did you guys go to the noodle house with, uh, with us that night in, in, uh, Chicago? No, uh, we went no. to the house of blues. Okay. I think so. Okay. Well, that was a different, a different thing, I guess. But anyway, we were, it was, uh, the Lincoln guy, Matthew Albright. Is that his name, JD? 
So the Lincoln, that Lincoln guy and Andrew and, and JD's big or little, big, big little brother, whatever. <laughs> um, and a few other people. But anyway, the topic tank came up about dual shield flux core and, and the subtle differences from one to another, even though they were really similar. If they had, if they're a little different. They might, one might need a little bit more voltage. One might need a little bit more of this, more stick out. And uh, they were talking about the Lincoln product catalog and how valuable that was to have because it had all that, all that in there. You know, every, every one of their products they have. And I've got a copy of it that Andrew sent me. I'll be talking about it before too long. I intended to, you know, sort of like bring it into a video and talk about it, encourage everybody to send off for one. But, yeah, it's just like a wealth of information there. And, and both J.D. and I are, are just thinking at the end of that dinner that we, neither one of us know anything about welding anymore. <laughs> because here's, oh, here's yeah. Andrew just talking about all these details and bringing out these little nuances about this, that, and the other, you know. And he's a sharp kid, but when he went on with Lincoln, he just, you know, he leaned in and learned everything he could while he was with Lincoln, too. But it was a great, a great little experience, even though we both felt dumb at the end of it, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> yeah, the point is the point is that you know you can you got a starting point with with uh, dual shield and even I guess self shielding, but all there's so many brands and so many different classifications within those brands and brand name things, and there's little one setting won't be the optimum setting for the same wire across the board. Esob, Technoweld, Bowler, Lincoln, you know they're all a little different, and they all require uh, you know finding that sweet spot. Yeah, what I do. Uh... What I've just recently done is I swapped over to UltraCore at 045, and I've never run that before. So what I did after – I got that after uh, that dinner. Mm-hmm. So I just typed in the, the numbers and letters up top. It's 75. A, there's an A in a – whatever came after UltraCore. I typed that in, and it popped up product catalog. Went to it, and it showed that – it just added like a scale where it showed all the wire feed and amperage, what everything read out at. Mm-hmm. I just went with the settings that it had there. At what I thought was what I was, whatever I was welding, perfect, spot on. So I think for like any kind of wire, you know, at all the numbers up at the top, whatever changes, you could pretty much just kind of do that. that you know, now that we have Google and everything in our pockets, mm-hmm. uh, kind of easy to find the product catalog just like that. Yeah, I've got the real, you know, the hard copy catalog in my office now. I'm just, you know, hadn't even really dug into it, but the other day I was thumbing through it. And I'm like. In a way, it's so much nicer than even having to look it up on Google. You know, you just got it all right there. Oh yeah, you know, on the shelf. So good. It's a good thing. I think, I think on the Lincoln site, there's a uh, option to request literature, and I think you can get one. Anybody can pretty much get one sent, get sent out if you want to. So yeah, I'm all about you know free references like that when they can save you time instead of playing blind archery and starting from not knowing anything about exactly where to start a certain wire get right in the ballpark to start with. It's just a, it's worth it to get, mm-hmm. to get, uh, get that information. No doubt. I got a question for you. All right. So are you, do you do much mobile stuff anymore? I mean, I know you do stuff at like the factories in the factories. Um, I'm interested in the Ranger that you have. I know we've talked about it and I know we, we talked about it in the podcast where we interviewed you last time as well, but do you have the 225 or the 250 Ranger. I got the 250. The 250. Okay, all right. Uh, I guess I'm I'm just trying to compare, you know, Miller versus Lincoln. How you like the Trailblazer? Um, down the road, I wouldn't mind picking up another used unit uh, to, to add to the arsenal. And actually, I, I intended to purchase the Lincoln, but it wasn't in stock, so I bought blue. Do you plan on getting an LN25 or anything off your generator or anything like that? Yeah, um, I've had an LN25 before. And what I have right now is an active eight. Okay. Which uh, it's the same thing, but it runs to smaller spools. And since oh, that's I, like, right. yeah. I like to, which kind of limits me, but the LN25 with a 40 pound spool in it is, it's heavy. I, mm-hmm. I'm not sitting around welding that much. If I ever need to, I'll use it again. But the little one, that's the one I'm using right now. And, but yeah, I, I do love using those, running them off the generators. I love it. Okay. Yeah, because I, when I picked mine up, I had a lot of people. I was really surprised how many people messaged me on Instagram asking how I liked it and everything. And today, today is the fourth, March fourth. I still have not struck an arc with the with it. I've only used it for power, um, so I can't tell you how I like it or not. But uh, I was kind of want to pick your brain about arc characteristics because that seems to be a an interesting topic between you know the characteristics of the Rangers versus the Trailblazers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So I've welded on a lot of generators and the level that we're in, it's kind of the commercial level, the industrial ones like the Vantage and the big blue, the arcs on those are phenomenal. They're the best. They, you can dial them in. It's got the different PC boards in them and all that stuff, but that's industrial. Those machines are crazy expensive. The ones we have at this range are pretty simple and the arc is not the best for like stick welding. TIG mm-hmm. welding, it's it's fine. You know, TIG welding DC is just like an arc's an arc. I mean, <laughs> if you get your tungsten sharp and right, I mean, everything's easy. With stick welding, I like the Miller Bobcat. I'm sure the tra- – I've never welded on a trailblazer, but it's like just a half step above the – is that what you have, the trailblazer? Yeah, I got the trailblazer, yeah. So was that a 302 or something or a 3? No, this, this is a 325. Yeah, so the, I've used a Bobcat 250, which is, you know, like below that one. Actually, I like the arc on those better. They seem a little smoother for like a 7018. Now, there is a break-in period. As soon as you get a brand-new machine, it's going to be crisp. I mean, all the little uh, contact points or whatever is inside the machine, there is a break-in period. I think you can see it somewhere in your manual, too, that says, maybe not. That might just be me. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I do notice, like, I, I was on site with a machine. Mine was brand-new, and there was a, the same machine that had a 1,000 hours on it. And the arc was softer on it. And it, it just like, when you get one and you strike up on it brand new with a 7018, I mean, that's a live wire. Like everything on it's brand new. It's just, mm-hmm. crisp. it's super crisp, which isn't bad, but <laughs> it's a lot tougher to get some of those nice peelers with a 7018 when it's rough, like a 6010, like it's running like a 6010. Right. Yeah. Actually, I kind of like Miller's generators better. I mean, a stick weld's a stick weld. Yeah. I think, I really think it's my my opinion I, i'm i'm not very experienced when it comes to running off of generators but it just would seem that that 6010 arc would be where you really would notice you know you'd need a certain arc characteristics for doing open root 6010s you're not going to run an open root 6010 and it's like some of the guys were doing not too long ago bob moffett and field res and all that flip their helmet up and you know take a take a sip of coffee while they're still running it your arc's got to be pretty spot on yeah. to be able to do that. And you're, you can't do that with every machine with a 6010. You know, the thing was just too finicky, you know. Mm-hmm. Get a little bit long on the arc length or a little too close and it'll go out. But some of those, you know, some of those SA200s and stuff just seem to have the, especially the red face with the copper windings and all that just seem to, people seem to love them for, <clears throat> for 6010, 6010 work. Yeah, but you can't do anything else with those machines. You can't run any power off of them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can weld or you can actually work. And so you got, there's a little trade off with the arc. And if you're using the, the welder, like uh, me and Jonathan got, I mean, you're fabbing and you're using the power just as much as you're using the welding on it. If, I mean, if not more. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Cause I mean, if you weren't, then you, you know, go get an SA. Things would be nice. <laughs> That's all you're doing is welding. But so how's it going with you, Jonathan? How, how's everything going? Doing good. Yes. Super, super busy. Actually just trying to keep myself organized and stay ahead and all the fun stuff that is involved with all that. Mm -hmm. You wish, you wish for work. And then when it rains, it's like, now what do we do? Oh yeah. Yeah. It it hits, it hits hard. It does. And that's kind of what I'm just, we've always said on the podcast that it ebbs and flows right now. It seems to be flowing and it will ebb again. You know, it'll back off. It'll be weeks on end. I'm sure looking for work, but I'm sure that you're the same way. I mean, I'm sure you. I I, I watch you pretty pretty carefully. I, I you you start to to watch people and you get to learn when they're busy and when they're not. But I I can see when you're slammed and you know seeing when you're not. So it's, it's yeah, it's pretty much November, December, and January is a little chill around here. And then halfway through February through October, it's pretty fun. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, since we get into a little bit of business here, I'd like to pick your brain. I think this would be educational for everyone that's listening here. You know, obviously the four of us all own a business and we each do different things and have different capabilities and different desires with our company. But, you know, we get asked all the time about growing your company and how to approach work and all kinds of stuff like that. I, I'm kind of curious seeing the work that you get into, JD, down there, you know, how you get what you get. You know, whether it's approaching cold calls or friends or knowing the right people or whatever it is, I just get an open conversation here going how you do things down there or what you want to share about it anyway. What, like how I get business? Yeah, yeah, basically. 
Um, I got my business started by going back to the people I'd worked with and it's just snowballed from there and snowballed. It doesn't continually grow, but I, once I, once I got the ball rolling, it, it just kind of kept going and I've bounced around. I, I used to do a lot of my work with a certain company and then I rolled over and I started doing more work with this company. And for me, it's just, it's only one person. I'm trying to keep it at that, but I've had as much as three employees at one time and doing quite a bit of work. That's before I met Jody and everything. And that's no fun to me at all. That was just all word of mouth. And it was, it's where I've grown is word of mouth just from mm-hmm. being able to do something. If you can actually weld, which kind of sets you apart from, I mean, 90% of the population of the working class. I mean, who else can weld? It's like magic to everybody. If you can actually get your name out there that you can weld and build stuff out of metal, then you're on a short list. Everywhere I look, it's a short list. Mm-hmm. So I, my business has grown just from word of mouth. That's how I've grown and bounced around from different people. But getting started, I went out and cold called some people, and that's kind of a – it's not really fun. No, but, uh, it's not really worked for me. I mean – I, of course, I guess I say that, and I got to keep in mind that I don't do it very much. So I try to make sure I find the right person or somebody that works there and start sending the emails and handshaking and all that stuff. But the first place, if you're ever going to cold call anything, I'd always say uh, go to the first place you want to work at. Like, don't just start. If you if you want to be close to the house, start working next to the close to the house. Like, start trying to find those places first. So when you do get busy, it's with the the stuff you want the most <laughs> always right. start there. Yeah. It's, and it's a hot topic. I know Roy and I talk about it quite often about, you know, getting little brochures or going out and passing business cards out or whatever it is. And of course, you know, watching what you do, it's like, well, you must be doing something similar to what I'm doing, I guess. You know, I'm not building spiral staircases necessarily, but you know, knowing somebody and obviously that, that seems to be the, <laughs> the key. Well, okay. So the spiral staircase, that's a brand new, uh, client. That client came to me from me wrecking my truck through the ice. I wrecked my, I wrecked my work truck, got staples in my head. And then I was talking to my mechanic, his landlord or some, something. Anyways, he's a contractor needed a welder. Well, I know a welder. I was just over at his shop today looking at his truck. (laughs) And so that's how I got this guy. And now I've, I've done, uh, the gate, and some posts. I've done a bunch of other work for this guy, and it looks like I'm going to be doing a bunch of other work for him as well. Mm. And that came from just being around, you know. <laughs> hey, I got a brand new client, so I mean, he came by the shop and then asked me if I could build a st- spiral staircase. I mean, that's just how it went. How do I, you know, so that's how the new business comes in. I mean, it's directly word of mouth. I've made brochures and I've made business cards and the t shirts and word of mouth. That's what mm. works for me. I know we've talked about the t-shirts and in the past, and I think most of us that have a small business, I think it's probably one of the first things we do now. And, you know, there's this new company out there called Beards and Lace that makes (laughs) awesome shirts. So, you know, there's no excuse now for, you know, those that are listening and you have a small business out of your garage or out of your basement or wherever you're at, just get a hold of Beards and Lace on Instagram and they will hook you up. little shameless plug for, you know, a certain person. (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) <laughs> oh, i'll wait for you to wait for you to jump in <laughs> so you guys did the walter pod podcast last week mm-hmm. and the the flap disc and everything trimming them i found a little i got an old lathe tool like a you know i don't even know what they are you know with the point on the end of it, the carbide tip mm-hmm. i threw that in the vice and used that to trim works really great Hmm. You know, they say just put it on the edge of the table. Yeah, it kind of gets a hot and it melts and it doesn't. I actually use like a cutting tool. It was, I don't know why I have it. I think it's my dad's. I just got like a scrap or a spare cheap. I think it says China on the side of it. But it's like a lathe tool with a carbide tip glued in the top of it. Worked really good for trimming the flap disc. Hmm. I tried idea. to make a video, but it, it didn't. Uh, I couldn't film it just right. I think I've got one of those laying around. But it works really good like instead of like trying to use the edge of the table or something. Mm-hmm. You know, actually using like a cutting tool in the vise. Yeah, for- good I've, idea. I've used that for chamfering small round parts on a mill. You just hook the, <laughs> the lathe tool up in the chuck and then put your part up in the quill part of the mill, lock it down and <laughs> ram it down into the lathe tool. Same exact thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. Worked great for uh, test coupons for a little aluminum pipe weld I had to do. Nice. Hmm. I guess uh, Fabtech. 
Yeah, that's the next thing we're looking at here in Atlanta, the next conference, and that'll be in November sometime. It's usually around early to early to middle of November. But um, of course, we'll we'll be I'll be going. JD will be going. Pretty sure Jonathan and Roy will be going, and uh, we we may do some type of meetup at JD shop during Fabtech sometime. We'll see see how that works out. But it yeah. was a fun it was a fun time for the uh, for WorkbenchCon attendees. A little bit different crowd at Fabtech, but but I think we'll, we'll probably still get some response. We'll definitely do something. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, man. Oh, It'll yeah. be here before we know it. You know. Yeah. They will. <laughs> yep. I'll go to the beach for two or three months and it'll be it'll be like it'll be here. <laughs> oh nice. I tell you. I'm I'm ready. I'll tell you right now. We can't really free up and go right right now, but you know, with with the way the past seven months or so have gone, you know, I'm I'm definitely ready for a little yeah, vacation. <clears throat> I'm I'm always ready for one. Yep. I just got a text come through from uh from Michael Garage Bound L L C in Chattanooga. He's mm-hmm. doing a doing a uh, a Boy Scout merit badge thing today and next Sunday. Um, I wasn't able to make it today. Uh, maybe I'll be able to make it next Sunday. We'll see. That'd be fun to go up there. That's only about an hour and a half for me. And uh, he seems like a seems like a good fella. Did you guys meet meet him at Fabtech last year? Mm-hmm. Yep. Talked to him from time to time. So what's uh, on the agenda for the future, JD? What uh, do you see yourself doing here? It's kind of interesting. Well, obviously, we can see what you're doing now pretty much in the shop, but I'm kind of curious to see where you want to be, where you're going to be, or what you got coming up in the next couple of months, year, whatever. Um, well, this is like my third shop in like four years. Uh, so hopefully I can grow into this one. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm actually, I feel like I've just been doing stuff half of what I could do just because I don't have the space or I didn't have the tools and I'm just going so hopefully I can actually get into this shop, grow, turn it into like a real fab shop, get some more tools, make everything better. Just I'm just trying to grow and perfect myself as a company or as a business. Just trying to, because <laughs> actually I feel like I've I might actually when you first start, say uh, you don't really know if it's gonna work, but then all of a sudden it's been like a year and you're like, well I, I guess it's gonna work, and then it gets kind of bad, and then it's like, well maybe it's not gonna work. But then, like, after, like, two or three years, you're like, oh, uh, well, I guess this is what I'm going to do. Maybe I should start taking it seriously now. <laughs> so right. that's kind of what I feel like now. Like, I need to get a truck. I need to, like, take myself seriously, I guess. That's what I'm trying to do this year. <laughs> awesome. Well, I can't wait to see you grow. Thanks. You too, man. Actually, a lot of growth has happened since I've been paying attention, you know. <laughs> I have to say, you got a lot more capability now than you had that first my first visit to your shop, which you still had. You were pretty well set up then, as far as your ability to, you know, saw horses, jack stands, cutting, welding, and all that. But you got a few more welding machines now. You got plasma cam. You got an overhead crane now. Precision fixture table. You're definitely uh, poised to do pretty much anything anybody throws your way. Yeah, that sort of feels like. They threw a bulldozer at me. <laughs> <laughs> True. And you did it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's just metal. That was fun. But that would have that would have been almost impossible without like the overhead crane. So I'm just trying to like line up the pinholes again. I mean, you can't can't get a forklift in there on that or uh uh there's nowhere to put like a port of power or so, I mean, you know, that right there was crucial just doing that. Mm-hmm. How do you like that uh, the plasma cam plasma table? I love the software. The table's uh, cheap, but it's that company needs to figure out what they want to do. They got really great software, but then they kind of market towards the homeowner, so their tables are cheap, and it's not easy to load anything over like eighth inch onto it. I mean, because you got these, it, it doesn't want like the table moves. It's not easy to load anything over eighth inch. So I don't really like the table. I mean, if you're not doing full sheet, like I'm trying to, I'm pushing it to the max. That's what I'm saying. But the software is amazing. I can do all this crazy stuff. So I'm going to try to do it. And then the table kind of holds me back, but I need to build like a crane or something for it. But so I I like the software. I just don't like the table per se. (laughs) Yeah. I'm still in in the market looking at different options and just kind of wanted to get your, your take on that one. Cause I know you use it if not daily once or twice a week for sure. 
say if I was going to put that up in a garage or like a home shop, I think it'd be great. I think I might have outgrown the table is what I'm saying, like right. me. But yeah. I'm trying to throw. You'd, you'd be doing a lot bigger stuff than I would ever do in my shop. Yeah. So like if, you, you know, it handles anything that you could pick up by yourself, you know, a four by four sheet of like, it's perfect for cutting out all kinds of stuff in the shop. And the software is great. Using the software, it's pretty easy. I mean, everything's 2D. It's not 3D modeling, so it's not too hard. But all the intuitive buttons are there to make. Well, I guess, what what do you guys do for, like, vinyl cutting and stuff? Like, what kind of software do you use to do what you do? We have um, just the software that came with our vinyl cutter. We use a Cricut cutter, so it has to use its design center software. Yeah, you okay. don't have any other choice. <laughs> <laughs> are there can, like do, can you modify the whatever you imported whatever picture you can you change that not not really i mean you can do a little bit but it it's really more towards like scrapbook stuff so okay. you're importing vector files and everything but if you can you know draw something up on uh, like fusion 360 or sketchup or something and you can make it a vector you can just pull it mm-hmm. over into that and it'll work just fine. Okay. So say you did that and say you were trying to cut, you wanted to change something, how you'd have to go all the way back out, start over and then yeah. like change the program. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I love about this stuff. Like half the time I'm doing something, as soon as I get started, I'm like, crap, I need to change this. I just pause it, go in, change this, move this line here, there. And then like, I just paused the machine. It stopped right. Where is that? I don't change anything. I don't have to save or get out. I just change it right there and press start. That's what I love about it because I'm, I'm not good at it. Nice. <laughs> I'm always having to fix everything. It's really easy to do that. That's good. I mean, being able to fix things on the fly is super important. Yeah. I mean, and it really helps you maximize stuff. Like half the time I'll go out in the beginning of the day and I'll cut this, this, and this. I don't have a couple circles missing. And then I'll just come back out there and then I'd, I can just pick stuff up and move it get it right on the scrap where I need it, change it, shrink it, make it fit. It's it's really easy to do everything on the fly with the machine. I like the machine and the table, I guess, in that sense. The table's just a little, un, needs to be a little, a little beefier. beefier for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be doing anything over, you know, a quarter inch max just because I couldn't possibly lift anything heavier. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like you were talking earlier in this episode, you know, we're you know, having the capabilities of lifting things. I just have an engine hoist. That's my limitations right there. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. But it's it's a pain. But yeah, it'd be great. And actually, like if you were putting this in a garage or something, you could uh, put a downdraft on it. Mm-hmm. And it works really good with a downdraft. If you can put it on some kind of a, a solid concrete surface that you can actually, I taped mine down and it made it airtight and it worked really well. Um. I need to do that where it's at now, but cool. still a lot to, to grow into that shop. Well, anyone else have anything want to talk about or want to wrap this one up? Well, I guess we'll wrap it up. <laughs> Can't <think of> nothing <laughs> else. <laughs> I'm thinking, I mean, I know we could keep the conversation going if we thought hard enough, but I think we've gone long enough. I just got to say Matavo. <laughs> got to say oh, it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're sorry, Walter. I tell you, we, we can't control what our people say when they're on here. <laughs> yeah, well, Walter and Matabo are like the same stuff, so it's all good. Matabo yeah. makes Walter's know. grinders. <laughs> no, it is. Walt uh, M- Matabo makes Walter's grinders, and Walter makes Matabo's abrasives. That's why they're all so good. I, I was talking to him at Fabtech. Like that's why they look so similar. Like seriously, Walter's like, no, we spend all our time doing this stuff, so they make the grinders to our specs, and that's why there's like. A four and a half and a six in Matabo, and then you got like the Walters, like the five. You know what I mean? It's kind of like they're the same, but not the same. Hmm. But actually, I've got a whole bunch of Walters products right now. They're cutting discs. I'm comparing them to the Matabo one, and uh, they're good stuff. So I like Walter. <laughs> <laughs> we did that video, Matabo versus Cutting Torch, which my brilliant idea to call it that, but but that's probably part of the reason it got so many views, I guess. But man. Right. They were some people that got their rough feathers ruffled on that on that thing. It was really kind of silly because the only reason we didn't also compare a plasma cutter was because we didn't have one in the shop that would cut that thick of metal. 
you know, didn't have one hooked up at the time. And so we just strictly compared a six inch Metabo with a cutting disc to a cutting torch. And, you know, one of them you cut, you got minimal cleanup. You still got a little deburring to do with using the grinder. Whereas if you, depend on how good you are with a torch, I mean, some guys could probably cut with a cutting torch and, and uh, barely hit it with a flap disc and be be good. But, you know, we timed them on certain things. And, and the Metabo came out on top until you got up to about three-quarter inch thick. And then the torch started winning out, you know. But, oh, man, it just uh, had, you know, basically people calling me a liar and thinking that Metabo was buying, uh, you know, some sponsoring the video and I was ruining a good channel for a few pennies and, you know, all kind of comments like that. I'm like, geez, people, settle down here, you know. Just took a stab at a video here, just trying to throw out some information. Can't yeah. please them all. That is a fact. You cannot. You can't, no matter how hard you try. And, you, you know, I've screwed up before and I'll probably screw up again in handling situations like that. But a couple of people will aren't allowed to post on my channel anymore. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Love you. <laughs> you got to do a little housekeeping, you know, every now and then. Yeah. This is true. Speaking of, we want to go ahead and wrap this one up and do all the Patreon stuff. We can do that. All right. We can do that once again. Thank all the top patrons. Thank everyone who supports this channel. Like we said before, the past several episodes, our patron support has been spiking which has been really good. You know, we went from just you know getting sporadic uh, patrons all over on Patreon.com to quite a few every week uh, joining up to support the podcast. Really appreciate that. It helps us to you know set aside the time and to make it worth our while, so to speak. As everyone wants everything wants something worth our while uh, to be able to do this and to to talk with you guys. We want to thank our top patrons once again. And I'm guaranteed to mess some of these names up, but we're going to give it the best shot that we can. This month, we'd like to thank Kimball Nihas, James Greer, David Doherty, Corey Dobson, Stephen Fish, Lick Skillet Fab, Anthony Crystal Malice, Smith's Industries, Michael Menz, Andy Hunter, Veteran Welding Co., Yusuf Khan, Andy Katonic, Black Sheep Fab Shop, Scott Tasso, Weldy McWelds, Richard Black, Mike Howe, James Yoakum, Eric Rupel, Thor Goodmanson, No San Juan, Shane Gunnan, Jacob Elder, SNS Metal Fab, and House of Chop. I did it, maybe. <laughs> if you would like to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com forward slash welding tips and tricks podcast. And as always, if you'd like to reach us here at the podcast, our email address.